Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. For those who are joining us for the first time, where we're coming from in this class is that we started out talking about the pre Socratics, which means <coughs> people who were before Socrates. Names like Thales, do you remember that name? He was an early philosopher who said that everything is made out of what? Everything comes from water. After that came, came Anaximenes, who said that everything is not made of water, everything is made out of air. After that was a person named Heraclitus. Heraclitus said things are not made of water or air, they're actually made out of fire. Just trying to figure out what this world is made out of and whether or not motion and change are really real. Do you remember that first class? We had the example of how it is that various persons like Empedocles, and Parmenides were telling us that there is no such thing as motion. That, for instance, when it comes to, to a fast runner like Achilles, if he gives the turtle a head start, there is no way that he can ever outrun the turtle. Like in a fast runner, never outrun the turtle, according to the arguments that they formulated. By the time that Achilles gets up to where the turtle began, the turtle has already moved. Interesting. So when he runs to where the turtle has moved now, what happens again? The turtle has moved. He can never surpass the, the slowest turtle. Simply one of his arguments against change and motion in this world. I remember that he had several arguments against that and several arguments for unity as well. So those were the pre-Socratics. We started off this course talking about the pre-Socratics. After that, we talked about Socrates. The three major philosophers in Greek philosophy are Socrates, and then his student was Plato. And then this evening, Plato was last class, which means that this evening we're jumping into the philosophy of his student, who was Aristotle. And then after we finish Aristotle this evening, there are other ancient schools of philosophy, but in this course we don't have time to go through them all. So we're going to fast forward to Neoplatonism. Why? Because in the development of Christianity, this is going to be the most important, and we'll see why. Because what's going to happen is after Aristotle, then Jesus is going to be born. And different things, people are going to think that Jesus of Nazareth is God. And they're going to re reconcile their scriptures with this Greek philosophy. And out of that, we're going to have many Christian ideas. And Neoplatonism, Neoplatonism is going to be a big influence in that respect. This evening then, where are we going? Aristotle and then... Neoplatonism. So we begin with Aristotle's life and writings. For those who've been following along, we're simply taking this from Father Fred Copleston's book, A History of Philosophy. Perhaps you've been enjoying reading it. For those of us who haven't had the chance to read it, this is essentially a summary of everything you otherwise would have read in this book. Aristotle's life. Aristotle, we see, was born around 384 B.C., lived for some 62 years, which means that he exited this world about 300 years before Jesus came around. Aristotle was born in Thrace, which is in Greece. He was the son of, a, of the physician of the Macedonian <coughs> king. So what is that going to mean then? His father is connected to the king because his father is the king's doctor. And so this is the king's doctor's son. So he's going to receive a fine education. I and mean, as we're going to see here in a moment, what's going to happen is that he, the, the son is actually going to educate the king's son one day. So Aristotle went off to study at Athens at age 17, studied in Plato's academy. So what we're going to see then is, in the same way that Plato studied under Socrates, Aristotle is going to study under Plato. Plato's school there in Athens was, was called the academy, and so Aristotle is going to be a student of Plato. So he was in constant contact with Plato until Plato's death in 348 or 347 BC. And what we're going to see is the same as what happened in, with, between Plato and Socrates. Do you remember Plato's first works were written about whom? Socrates. And then after Socrates died, he started to formulate his own thought. <laughs> guess, what are we going to guess is going to happen here as well? Aristotle is going to start by using his master's ideas and writing about them, but then after his master exits the stage, and after Aristotle leaves Athens, what's going to happen? He's going to start exploring his own ideas. 
But during, during Plato's lifetime, there was no break be between master and student. There was no falling out. They were together through all of Plato's life. The falling out with the academy will happen here after Plato's death. So Plato's metaphysical and religious teachings had a, a lasting influence on Aristotle. Let's pause and make sure that we remember what that word metaphysical means. We're used to seeing the word physical. Is there anything in this room that's physical? Anything in this room that's physical? Anything that we can touch is physical. So what is the metaphysical? Meta is a Greek root meaning above. So anything that we can't see or taste or touch is the metaphysical. Can you see God in this room right now? Is a physical object? No, God is metaphysical. God is metaphysical. What happens then is that Aristotle is going to adopt Plato's views on metaphysics, on things that we can't see. Do we remember what some of those ideas that Plato had about metaphysics? Whew, this is remembering the last class here. What did Plato say about the things that we can't see? Even though we can't see them, can we, can we know something about them? We can. His argument was that there are some things in this world that are good. Have you ever said that something is good? Oh, you're a good student. You're a good child. You're a good, this is a good class. Have you ever said that something is good? If so, how do you judge good? That's in relationship to other things that are good. Which ultimately, if there are things that are on a scale of being good, there must be an ultimate good with a capital G. In Christianity, we know that ultimate good as God. God is the good with a capital G. For Plato, though, the way that we know things that are good is in light of these forms or ideas. So he said that there exist these forms or ideas of what the good is, that this good with a capital G exists. Beauty with a capital B exists, justice with a capital J exists, and it's in light of those metaphysical forms that we know things as good or beautiful or just. So Aristotle was a student of Plato, and Aristotle learned all of that beginning at 17 years old when he went to Athens and was part of the academy. So Plato's ideas, especially his metaphysical and religious ideas, would have an influence on Aristotle, and Aristotle only later, after Plato was dead, would begin to develop his own theories, his own philosophy. So what happened after Plato's death? After Plato's death, Plato was the head of the academy, the school that we had there in Athens. Was Aristotle named the next director of the academy? No. Which is actually why he left Athens. So Plato's nephew was named the successor of Plato and took over the academy. And we don't know what happened between Plato's nephew and Aristotle. All we know is that Aristotle decided to leave town after that. Maybe they didn't get along. Maybe they got along, but Aristotle was a little miffed that he didn't become the head of the academy. And he, was, he decided, you know what, I'm not going to be the vice president of the academy. Right? And so we don't know what, ha what happened. All we know is that Aristotle then left Athens with Xenocrates and went to Assos, where he founded his own branch of the academy. Okay, there's an academy in Athens. Why not think of multiplying this model? Let's start our own academy, our own school in Assos. Where is Assos? Assos is in modern-day Turkey. And it, then, now that Plato is, is dead, Aristotle is developing his own branch of the academy, and now he's going to develop his own ideas, if you will. So Aristotle now is no longer in Greece. He's left Athens. He left, he's left Greece. What country does he find himself now in Assos? He's in the country of modern-day Turkey. Interesting. So in 343, he was invited by Philip of Macedon to educate Philip's son, who we now know as Alexander the Great. How interesting. So when we hear that name, Alexander the Great, who is Alexander the Great's teacher? Aristotle. Interesting. So here, Aristotle, the son of the king's physician, was now the teacher of the Macedonian king's son, Alexander, who later become known as Alexander the Great. Which is fascinating because when you read stories of Alexander, you can, you can sometimes hear influences of Aristotle and Plato and some of the philosophers and some of the things that he said. For instance, there's, there's a story that's told that at his uh, funeral, Alexander the Great asked that his hands be put outside of the casket. How's that for odd? 
So, you know, most people are inside the casket in whatever posture they're in the casket. He said, put my hands outside the casket so that everyone can see that my hands are empty and I'm leaving this world with wow. nothing. With empty hands. Whoa, that was actually quite a deep thought, if true. I mean, and you could, we can see how it is that some of those thoughts go back to philosophers like this, who are starting to look at things in this world and say, you know, money, sure, it's nice, you can buy some things, but is that going to lead to happiness? And are those, those things that you buy, are those things that you can take with you when you die? <laughs> so Alexander now is being educated by Aristotle up until the time that Alexander becomes the emperor. You know, at a certain time, he's no longer going to be the, the prince, but he's going to become the emperor. And so what's going to happen then is at that time, Aristotle is no longer going to be needed because he's no longer in school. He's busy being king, being emperor. In order to acknowledge his debt to Aristotle, his teacher, though, oh, how nice that would be. For those of us who's ever, who've ever taught, you know, it's nice when students are grateful. Alexander, being a grateful student, actually went and rebuilt Aristotle's hometown, Stagera, in order to be able to honor his teacher, Aristotle. So Aristotle rebuilt, returned to his home that Alexander rebuilt. And then in 335 to 334, about two years later, more or less, Aristotle returned to Athens and founded his own school. So Plato's school was called the Academy. The school that Aristotle is going to found is, is called the Lyceum. The Lyceum is found in the northeast part of the city. And the school is also known as the Peripatos. Why? Have you heard the, heard the English word peripatetic before? Peripatetic simply means walking. He is a very peripatetic person. He walks two miles a day, or he walks five miles a day. Peripatetic, walking, or ambulatory. Interesting. So how are we going to guess that they learned at the Lyceum? Did they learn sitting down in chairs? They learned walking and talking about things. So we had an interesting model of learning. It was more, you know, it was exercise for the body and exercise for the mind at the same time. So it was known as the peripatos because of their peripatetic, their ambulatory or walking nature of instruction. Let's go for a walk, okay? Let's go for a walk and talk about the ideas that we have while we're walking. Alexander the Great died in 323. How interesting. We said that Alexander was from, was the son of Philip of Macedon, Macedonia. How interesting that after Alexander died, there was this big pushback of the Greeks against the Macedonians. And so as part of that, Aristotle was in, accused of impiety or of ungodliness. Have we heard of another philosopher being accused of this? History tends to be cyclical, right? So Socrates was accused of impiety, of ungodliness, of introducing new religions, was made to drink the hemlock, which we learned to, we, we learned as part of the carrot family. Be careful, right? So Socrates read the Hemma, died, and Aristotle then fled the city, simply because now that he's been accused of this, Socrates, we know, had the chance to flee, <coughs> to go into exile, yeah. but he wouldn't. He would obey the law. Aristotle, he says, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and so he left Athens saying, lest the Athenians sin against philosophy for a second time. <laughs> which is great. It's fitting with Aristotle's ethics, because we're going to see he's always thinking about the end goal and what is the good in all of this. For him, the good was not standing up for his principles right now. The good was living another day to be able to teach other people the things that he had learned. So after he left then, he went to live on his deceased mother's estate in Chalcis in Greece, and he died shortly thereafter in 322. So we see that Alexander died in 323, Roughly a year later, Aristotle was dead as well.